so um, first let me start with who am I and what do I do? Um, so my name is Guido, I'm from the Netherlands and I am a co-owner and CTO of the hosting company in the Netherlands but I also do a Ceph consultancy with my own company and training as well. So I've been in a uh, part of the Ceph community since early 2010, actually late 2009. I didn't know what the exact date is, somewhere around Christmas when I figured out uh, that Ceph existed. And um, I wrote the integration for CloudStack, I wrote the RBD storage pool support, um, for uh, Libvirt and I wrote PHP bindings, Java bindings, all kinds of stuff for the project. Um, actually, which my customers needed, so I started writing it and actually donated it to the project. So what is 421? Well, it's a consultancy company focused on Ceph and its ecosystem and actually it's my company and I'm the only employee. Yes, I run it with a couple of people, but I'm the only one working in the company actually doing Ceph consultancy. So what happens when I deploy Ceph, I go to numerous organizations from tiny companies deploying Ceph to larger governments deploying Ceph, larger companies, all kinds of organizations I see from the inside and they all want to deploy Ceph, but they don't have a single clue of how to deploy Ceph. So I come in there and actually help them with deploying Ceph. And I see stuff going wrong very often. They come up with, with setups and I'm like, why are you want to deploy it this way? So it's lucky for them, I come in early, and actually try to fix their errors before it actually goes into production. So it all starts with gathering information. It starts like your deployment. Are you want to deploy RBD? So do you want to deploy cloud with virtual machines? Or do you just want to store objects like storing images or uh, movies or whatever? You want to store objects. And then the requirements is going to be terabytes or petabytes. And then the I.O. requirements. And it's printed bold because nobody thinks about I.O. They always come in and they say, well, we need like 300 terabytes. I say, sure, that's like 100 disks. But how much I.O. do you need? And they're like, well, I don't know. We need just storage. Yeah, but how much I.O. do you need? Well, not a single clue. And then slowly as we work through the process, we figure out they actually need a lot of I.O and they don't need that much storage because they do raw calculations on their storage but they always forget about the I.O. So then when we get to the part where I.O. is expensive, where is it? Actually when you look at a single drive it does about 90 IOPS per second and a 3 terabyte drive currently it's about 150 euros so per I.O. you're paying like 1 euro 60 for a I.O. When you look at an SSD, it does about 25k IOs. You can debate about how big the IOs are, etc., etc., or look at the white papers from Intel. But let's assume it does 25k IOs per second. So that's like one cent per IO. Suddenly, is IO expensive? No, it's not. Storage capacity might be expensive when you look at an IO, when you want a lot of IO. But IOs themselves are not expensive. So design for I.O. That's always what I say to my customers. Yes, the six terabyte drive is out there, so let's go start buying six terabyte drives. No, because they simply do not scale in most situations. If you have archiving uh, requirements with Ceph, you might use the new six terabyte drives or four terabytes, but usually people want I.O. They want to do cloud deployments. I see like 90% of deployments is with CloudStack or with OpenStack. They all need I.O. instead of storage capacity. So again, keep designing for I.O. So that means you want more spindles. So maybe go for one terabyte drives. I recently did a deployment where we used one terabyte drives because they were cheap to find and actually because we got more spindles and actually build a large cluster just for the parallel I.O. Because that's where Ceph excels, doing a lot of parallel I.O. So this deployment is running 1500 virtual machines. They're all, all hammering the Ceph cluster. Yes, we would have gone for two terabyte drives, but then um, they would be tempted to fill those drives very to like 80% of two terabytes. So when we go for one terabyte drives, you cannot, you can't be tempted to overfill them that much because there's only one terabyte available on those drives. So um, go for smaller drives, get more spindles in the system, and then you actually get more I.O. You can go even go for consumer drives. Of course, we've been talking about big budgets. We can be a big company which has millions to spend on hardware, but I also see the smaller companies and they accept the risk that drives fail. But Ceph is also designed to work to mitigate failure. So if a drive fails, we have replication, then the other replicas kick in, recovery kicks in, and the drive gets reconstructed again, or actually the data gets reconstructed and replicated again. So you can go for cheaper drives if you want to. It's your own decision if you want to do so or not. But maybe go for SSD only. And then I go back to 
my previous slide, we're designing for I.O. And if we look, if we're looking for I.O.s, then SSD is the best option. Yes, it might be that Ceph itself needs optimization to get the maximum performance out of the, the SSDs, but if you simply look at the statistics which a single drive does or what an SSD does, still the SSDs are currently going to give you a lot better performance than spinning disks are. Um, I would recommend actually going for the Intel data center series. They're not that expensive, they're not cheap either, but they give you good bang for bucks when deploying. But you also want to look at recovery operations, because whenever a machine fails, the other machines in the cluster have to copy over the data to each other because the machine failed. During recovery, you'll see that the I.O. starts spiking on your disks, because the other OSDs, they have to start reading all the PG logs, all the logs, all the information, and then they have to start transferring data. So under normal circumstances, it might work just fine. Your I.O. load might be low in your systems, you're like, Everything is fine. Remember what Florian said, health okay. We're like, yes, health okay. And then suddenly it goes to health born and then disaster strikes. Because, well, yeah, and actually it does. You know the situations. The disks start spinning, they start reading data, the, the network gets utilized, it starts pumping over data between machines, and suddenly we're going to see 100% utilization in all the drives. Then the customers call me and they say, it's down. Well, no, it's not down actually, it's just busy recovering. Because it's simply the disk cannot keep up with all the recovery operations happening. Uh, a simple example, recently a customer of mine had lost a machine, um, it had six 3 terabyte drives, there was like 800 gigs on each drive and the machine simply power failure, uh, power supply failed in the night and the cluster started recovering. That was about 3.6 terabytes of data which had to be copied over, you would say wow over 10 gig network, well it's like uh, well, a couple of, uh, like let's say an hour or something and we're done. But the other disk still starts reading the data while client I.O. was still coming in. And suddenly we had to, uh, a lot more I.O. going on and then client I.O. became a lot slower due to the recovery happening. So I would say design for I.O. but always take this margin in your design and actually test if it works. So pull out those machines and see if it actually works during recovery. And also do the same test when the cluster is actually full. Because you can do it at the beginning when there's like 20 gigabytes per disk and see, yeah, it works. No, fill up the whole system and do it again. And then you suddenly find out that three terabyte drives are simply too big in most situations. So deployments, I've done numerous deployments and I'm going to showcase two. I would well, I'd like to showcase more, but I left 30 minutes, so I'll take two just to show some applications which are being used or where Ceph is being used. So the first one is in uh, Belgium. It's a government. Uh, I'm not going to say which part of the government because they didn't want to tell me which part it was. Um, <laughs> it's just the Belgian government somewhere. Um, uh, they're deploying um, RBD with CloudStack and they're also using um, the Rados gateway for object storage. Um, their requirements is about a thousand virtual machines which they're going to run and they also have some databases running there and they actually also want uh, Amazon S3 comp compatible storage. The actual data in there, I don't know what it is, but they're storing data in there. So their first question was, we want to store a thousand virtual machines. And I know when they came in, it was last, uh, last winter, they came to my office and actually we discussed their hardware uh, with which they designed. And they came up with HP hardware, it was two million euros for a deployment. Like two million euros for a Ceph cluster, for a reasonably small Ceph cluster. I gave them, they gave me one day and I started calling Supermicro and HP and such and it went down to 1.1 million in one day. So they saved 900,000 euros in one day by actually letting somebody review their, their, actually, their hardware requirements because they were still thinking in a traditional way of designing systems so they were going for the most expensive machines, enterprise drives, RAID controllers, they were actually wanted to use RAID underneath Ceph as well. Um, so it became pretty expensive. But again, they were only thinking about terabytes. They were not thinking about I.O. at all. So we had to turn it the other way around and actually go again for designing for um, I.O. instead of storage capacity because they simply had not enough drives in the system to actually cope with all the I.O. because a thousand virtual machines is going to give you a lot of I.O. and still think about the recovery operations because you want to pull out a machine and still have I.O. continuing of those machines. 
so it actually we uh, ended up with uh, these systems. Currently it's 16 nodes. Due to budget cuts they actually had to order 50% of the cluster and um, in the next six months they're going to get the, because it's the next year they'll get the 50% again of the system to expand. Um, um, like was uh, explained by uh, by IBM, we, we used we're using some uh, quick uh, SSDs for journaling. There's also another SSD in there for um, SSD only storage inside the Ceph cluster, and then there's 19 one terabyte um, drives, actually two and a half inch drives. And uh, why two and a half inch? Well, actually the SSDs are two and a half inch, but a two and a half inch drive also gives you lower latency because simply the drive is smaller. So the seek of the head, it's, it's a shorter period which it takes. So it's minimal, but again, it's a small performance gain. And Supermicro is a cool 2U system where you can house in 24 drives. Um, 64 gigs of memory, um, actually it gave us about 80 terabytes of storage capacity using three times application and I always say designed for 80% filling of the system so always calculate the capacity and go for 80% why? well it could be that a machine fails at night and you don't notice the machine fails recovery kicks in and suddenly all the data from the other machines has to be redistributed inside the cluster and then it might be that you're gonna fill up one OSD if the OSDs are at like 90% and one machine fails, then it starts copying over and you can fill up other OSDs and actually the system stops. Whenever Ceph sees one OSD going over a certain limit, which you can configure, but by default it's I think 95%, it actually stops all I.O. in the whole system. Consistency goes over availability and we cannot guarantee data consistency when we actually start filling up a file system to 100%. So never, never, never let any OSD go over 95% because your whole system will simply shut down. So that's when designing go over 80% at maximum and when you see a certain OSD climb towards 80%, the only remedy is remove data or actually buy more machines. And it's simple, buy more machines, add them to the system, data redistributes, and again, you have more capacity. It's that easy. Well, we have three small nodes running uh, as monitors with an SSD um, for the operating system and monitor data. So why dedicated machines and not use, let's say, any of your existing machines, uh, which also run OSDs? Because technically, you can run the monitors anywhere you want to. Well, as explained before, um, the monitors, they do a lot of synchronous I.O. towards their data store to actually make sure they are in a consistent state with all the maps, happen, all the changes happening inside the Ceph cluster. But there's a different reason as well. The monitors are time, very time sensitive. They have to reply to heartbeats and to um, things towards each other within a couple of milliseconds. If there is CPU, a lot of CPU load on the OSD machines due to recovery, it might be that the monitors cannot reply um, um, to those pings or heartbeat checks and then if the monitors are no longer um, <coughs> Um, uh, th there's an election going on, and when, there, when there's no, um, there's none of the votes coming up for the election, the whole system stops again. Consistency goes over availability. So a couple of small machines, might be old machines even, just run them as your monitors, make sure they have dedicated resources on physical hardware running. And always have an odd number of monitors. So one, but there's no redundancy, go for three. So why not two? Actually, anybody can answer the question. Yeah, Florian, I know, but I uh, see two hands, sorry. Um, yeah, true, because if you have two monitors and one says he's down, the other says no, he's not down, who wins? We don't know. So if you have an odd number of monitors, then there's always going to be a quorum because there's going to be a vote and then there's always going to be somebody winning. If they do not agree with all three monitors, then you have a network problem probably. Your network is down or some something happening. It's outside Ceph's um, ability to fix. Um, so go for three monitors, scale up to five when the cluster becomes really big, but then you're looking at a really huge deployment when you need three monitor or five monitors. How big is really huge? How big is really huge? Um, you have to actually, well, um, we're looking at scaling out to around 10 to 15 petabytes. Okay, then you um, probably need five monitors, maybe seven at some point. Um, if we go deeper into Ceph, how it works, um, data is split up in placement groups uh, by, by the algorithm. Each OSD 
um, period periodically sends its statistics about the placement groups back to the monitors. Um, it picks one of the monitors where it sends the statistics from the placement group. If you have a lot of placement groups, those monitors will get a lot of information about the placement groups coming towards them. So if you get more monitors, you can load balance the information. It will do it itself, load balancing the, uh, the uh, PG statistics. Um, but it's a simple process. If you notice the monitors getting overloaded, simply add more monitors um, without any downtime and the system scales out. But you're probably looking, if you're looking at 10 petabytes, 15 petabytes, they probably need more than three monitors. Actually, it's, that's a big deployment. So, um, one of the things we wanted to do, because I mentioned here earlier, we want to have SSD-only storage, is that we want to have some pools running on SSD and some pools running on disk. But I don't like to do stuff manually, because that takes a lot of time, and when you want to do expansion again, we don't want to do manual uh, work. So, let's say we want to have a pool for the, the databases running on SSD only, and the other virtual machines are going to be running on spinning disks only. So how do we do that? Because the crush algorithm inside Ceph is the algorithm which tells us where data goes. Whenever a OSD boots up, it inserts itself into what we call the crush map. The crush map is the way to tell the cluster and also the clients where to, how we can calculate where it can find data. So whenever it starts up. Um, I created a cool script which starts up and which actually finds out that the drive where it's running on, if it's a rotational drive or not. The kernel nowadays tells us if it's a rotational drive or not. So if it is, we tell it's going to be root HDD. It starts in the root, in the crush map, tell which rack it's in, and then host, it's its own host, minus HDD at the end. You may want to mention that some controllers lie about this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's always the corner cases, but in this case, it was a simple LSI controller in JBot mode you know, with the IT firmware, and actually it, it told us that, it, okay, I haven't seen that case, but true, controllers lie all the time. Yeah. So if we detect that the OSD is actually running on an SSD, then we'll actually put it in rack called R key. RK01, rack 01, um, minus SSD, we create the racks themselves uh, in, the, in the crush map, and then it injects itself at the right location inside the crush map. So whenever we simply add a new machine, it injects itself into the crush map at the right location. So we can simply add a new machine with uh, Ansible, we have to make, make sure the scripts are all in place, and then the machine adds itself to the crush map at the right location. The rack name is actually encoded inside the host name of the machine. So there's DC2 for data center 2 minus rack 01. One. So inside the, in the host name, we know where it is. You can find the whole script actually on my GitHub page, but it was too big to paste the full script here. So if you want to review it, go to my GitHub page. Um, so in the end, actually, we simply have in the Ceph configuration say crush location uh, hook, and it executes the small script. It gets a couple of parameters, and then actually it injects the OSD at the right location. So easy if you want to have a mixture inside your Ceph cluster where you have spinning disks and SSDs in one single um, um, chassis, it might be easy to use this to actually have a dynamic situation. So um, a couple of highlights of the system, actually automatic assignment of the OSDs to, uh, uh, according to their type. Um, it's designed for IOs, so we went for smaller drives and we want to have more drives. Um, the radios gateways for object storage, and actually the hardest part is here, de convincing developers to use object storage instead of file storage. Um, I always call NFS a network frustration system, um, <laughs> because it's always a pain in the ass to actually get NFS up and running. Well, NFS up and running is easy. Getting it high available and actually getting your, applic your application start blocking whenever NFS is, is causing you problems. Um, that's always the downside of using NFS. Um, so in this case, at the government, uh, they are running. Uh, they all these, these all kind of departments. They're all um, spinning up virtual machines because they want to virtual machines for a periodic for a website or something. Or there's going to be uh, an announcement from the government that they need a uh, um, temporary website, uh, and they want to store images. And what they now do, they create a small virtual machine which is an NFS server. Then create two web servers which read the images from the NFS server. And I say, well, we have object storage. Please put them in objects and serve them directly to the clients. But no, the hardest part is actually convincing the developers of those applications use object storage instead of file storage. That's still a challenge. <clears throat> Well, in the future, the cluster is going to double in size, and whenever they need, we simply add more machines and the system s keeps scaling out. 
So let's see now the first use case. And the second use case is actually running OCFS2, which I found pretty interesting on top of RBD. Yeah, it's an interesting use case. Um, it's an, it's, a, um, it's an ISP um, based in Amsterdam in the Netherlands and um, they had this use case where they needed shared storage between web servers and they came up with a bold idea saying we want to run OCFS. So they came to me and said we want to run OCFS on top of RBD but we have we simply need more Ceph knowledge to build the system. I said well sure I haven't run OCFS but let's see, let's see what works. Their ultimate goal is to use CephFS but CephFS is not stable enough yet for their uh, situation. John, I missed your talk this morning, but probably you told a lot of interesting information about CephFS and the status. Um, um, but currently they're using OCFS. Um, again, they went for a SSD only deployment. Um, um, IBM machines actually, so this is the first deployment I saw on IBM machines. They're a huge uh, IBM uh, fan at, at the company. Um, <coughs> And it gave us about nine terabytes of, of uh, storage at simply with nine nodes. Um, and three small machines again, IBM again, also using as the monitors. And in this case, I mentioned specifically that we're using 10 gig network and why. I'll get to that later. So actually, the um, OCFS part itself, we simply use this. We have the Ceph cluster running, we have the web servers running, kernel RBE running there, and then OCFS on top of it have a shared file system on the web servers. It actually works great. Performance-wise, it might be better, but for this situation, they don't have a really high I.O. requirement currently. A lot of I.O. goes parallel. Um, um, it works great. What we actually did, um, who, knows, uh, who doesn't know OCFS actually, because I assumed... Um, okay. Then I get a step back. Usually, uh, when you have a sing, let's say you have iSCSI and you have two machines accessing the same LUN and you run X4 on top of it, when they start writing data, X4 has no knowledge of actually being in a cluster system where there's a se separate file system writing data to it. OCFS, um, designed by Oracle, I think, um, is built to run uh, on shared block devices. So it was used, uh, a lot of people used it with iSCSI, um, shared file system, to create a shared file system um, on top of um, iSCSI. But you can also use it with kernel, kernel RBD. Um, so RBD disks are shared between the systems and X4 or XFS simply can't be, you, you can mount it but you'll destroy your data uh, immediately. So um, it can't be mounted safely um, on multiple system locations at the same time. All the challenges were in OCFS, not in Ceph. That's actually my, my conclusion here. Um, uh, Ceph worked just fine. Uh, we actually uh, had a couple of, we had a IBM machine actually burned down, the mainboard burned. Um, so, uh, uh, but uh, it, it survived without any uh, problems. Um, <coughs> what I have to say there actually is that in this situation, we saw the SSDs really um, showing uh, how much IO they can do because recovery kicked in and we didn't see the 100% utilization of the drives. The recovery went pretty smoothly over the system because the SSDs could simply cope with the IO demand. Ooh, damn. Yeah. Um, uh, could cope with the IO demand um, uh, coming in for the recovery. But the thing I wanted to mention when you're designing for IO, actually look for latency. So, um, a quick uh, comparison, if you do a 16k packet round trip over a gig, net gig network, you're looking at about 0.8 until 1.1 milliseconds for the uh, round trip. True, it depends on the switching you're using, but... So, you can't run native 16k packet, you can um, uh, no, indeed, it did, of course, we sent over the jumbo frame network and it was split into two packets, of course, by the network, but we wanted to actually uh, test a couple of things. We found out it's about 0.8 to 1.1 milliseconds for the packet. At 10 gig network, 0.3.4, using different switching, different network cards might go to 0.2, I don't know, but there's a huge latency difference between um, those. So, usually your Ceph system bandwidth is not the problem. Usually it's latency on the network, and that's why you want to use 10 gigs on most situ for most situations, simply to get the latency down to get more I.O., because we're designing for I.O. performance. Um, <coughs> the system I mentioned earlier, running in Belgium, running a thousand virtual machines, on a given average day, it does about three gigabits of bandwidth throughout the whole cluster. That is actually doing, I think, about 10,000 I.O.s per second currently. So it's not about bandwidth in this situation with virtual machines most of the time. It's about I.O. and then 
think about the latency. So again, full SSD cluster. I running out of time, so I'm actually um, gonna go to uh, you know, Florian. You. Really quick question: How do you handle in an in an OCFS2 cluster with RBD? How do you handle fencing? How do you handle uh, RBD locking? And how do you handle uh, RBD lock preemption? Uh, we actually didn't go for locking. Um, I have to say that the OCFS part wasn't the biggest thing I did in the system because I just wanted to showcase actually that somebody did OCFS on top of RBD and it works. Um, I'm not full into the OCFS deployment details. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> But also, so um, I wanted to reiterate a couple of things which I actually told during uh, my presentation. So a couple of do's and don'ts when building your system. So when you're actually building your system, design for I.O., not for raw terabytes. Forget about the terabytes, go for I.O. first and then think about how much capacity do I need and then simply add more drives to get to the capacity. Go for I.O. first. Think about network latency. One gig might be sufficient in terms of bandwidth. But 10 gigs gives you a lot better latency, especially when designing, when deploying SSD only, you want 10 gigs just for latency. And use smaller machines. That's something I want to tell people. Um, I walked into a customer's office um, a couple of weeks ago. They, were, they wanted to deploy Ceph and they said, well, we have a, a hardware description here. They wanted to buy three huge machines and say, three times replication and we're done. Imagine if one of the machines goes down, then we're losing a third of the, of the cluster. So it's better to go for more smaller machines than go for a lot of big machines. I usually say that um, one machine should be 10% or less of the Ceph system. And actually going down towards 5% is even better. So the more machines you get, um, the less stress also recovery uh, gives on the whole cluster because it's simply more machines, more spinning disks uh, working there. And test those recovery situations. Walk into the data center and pull out the power plug. So don't go, simply go in physically or go into IPMI or IDRAC, whatever you use, and power off the machine, do a hard power off. You want to test if it works and do that while the system is completely full. And reboot your machines. I, because all traditional systems, they had uptimes like 1200 days and people were happy because it, it was up for 1200 days. With Ceph, please do reboot those machines. If there's an update for let's say the kernel or, or libc6, update the machine and reboot it. Verify that it actually works after a reboot. Oh, I use dedicated hardware for the monitors, I mentioned it uh, earlier. So. Build a system like this. A lot of 1U machines all being one big Ceph cluster. There's also got to be some don'ts. Don't create too many placement groups. They eat CPU and memory. I currently have a system running somewhere at the customer. He broke it earlier this week because he actually created 80,000 placement groups on the system and currently the CPUs are using 100% and I don't have a clue yet to fix the system because it's eating so much memory in CPU that the cluster won't be, it's not able to recover from it because it's overloaded. Um, PG, um breaking PGs because we are growing the cluster versus uh, creating too many PGs. No, he actually, well, what they did is um, they there were two pools in the system which were running um, uh, semi-production. It's Luckily, it's not production yet. Um, they wanted to have some test pools for some other applications. They simply took my PG number because they didn't know what PGs were and they created 10 new pools with all 8,000 placement groups. Okay. And that actually created so many placement groups without even storing data in it because but placement groups eat memory and CPU. So be aware of creating too many too many placement groups. My, my question is oh. different. Start oh. with a small cluster growing it into Oh yeah, you, you you should always start with a low number of PGs so you can we call PG splitting. So you can add you you can expand the amount of PGs but always do it slowly. So if you add more machines don't double the amount of PGs at once. Simply take baby steps and actually expanding the amount of PGs to the number which you want to get to. I think we should split early the number of PGs because the cluster is still small and we still don't have a lot of data to it because when when we split the PGs, uh, there will be all the rebalancing. Going. Yeah, true, but um, uh, if the cluster is small and you have a, a large amount of PGs, it eats too much memory on those OSDs, and then pairing and recovery takes too much time. Um, so, um, and data itself doesn't really matter for the amount of PGs. It's actually PG itself which eats memory. Um, um, 
oh, uh, actually there's a typo. It's, it's, it should say, don't try to be smarter than Ceph, because Ceph itself is really smart. Um, uh, so don't try to outsmart Ceph itself. So let it do its job. If it's recovering, don't start restarting OSDs because you think it takes too long. And um, no, usually it fixes itself. So don't try to outsmart Ceph, let it do its work. Um, why, well, I, I, something went wrong here. It should say, don't buy the most expensive. Okay, so something happened. <laughs> yeah, but it, it, true. Okay, well, uh, sorry, I got confused here. Um, uh, so, um, um, don't buy the most expensive machines. Um, I actually, um, uh, people still want to buy really expensive machines, um, and Ceph is designed for hardware failure. So let it let the hardware fill. If you take a let's say the machine could have an uptime of 99999999 percent, or strip a couple of nines from the total number and save thousands of dollars, euros or pounds, uh, whatever the currency is, uh, and spend it on buying more machines, because then simply you get a higher reliability inside the whole system. Um, I also see people using RAID one for the journaling OSDs. Don't simply split out the OSDs over the two SSDs. And don't buy these machines. <laughs> don't. Simply don't. Or you should have a really, really, really huge deployment. But I actually had a customer who wanted to buy these machines, 72 drives in a single chassis. So I actually have a friend running those quite happily for backup. For backup, okay. Yeah, there's always corner. There's a rack full of these. There's always corner cases where it works. But usually this is going to be a horrible situation when recovery comes in because then even 10 gigs won't be sufficient to get all the drives do their work. Um, and CP, not to talk about CPU power and memory requirements inside those machines. Um, and remember, hardware failure is the rule and not the exception. Ceph was designed to have hardware fail all the time. Please let the hardware fail. Um, uh, actually, well, it shouldn't, but if it fails, let it fail. Don't, don't, don't do stupid things like using RAID underneath Ceph. Forget it ever existed. Um, and consistency goes over availability. So why does Ceph do synchronous I.O.? Consistency, consistency, consistency. Yes, availability is very cool, but losing data is <coughs> the worst disaster you can ever have. So, um, any questions left?